Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to what I'm sure will be an interesting and educational event. So violent radicalization is a reality that has unfortunately become a hot topic used and misused in ways that has been misleading and counterproductive. On the other hand, it is an issue that needs attention in order to discuss openly the need for communities to come together and address these issues and problems in a manner that will benefit all Canadians and keep our Canada safe. This educational event endeavors to better understand the issue of violent radicalization and the way in which it impacts the Muslims and broader Canadian community. We hope this discussion will answer the following important questions. Why does a person who is raised in the West decide to leave their life here to fight overseas? How do we stop more people from going? What are our national security concerns in relation to these individuals? What does Islamophobia, foreign policy, and media coverage fit in with all of this? And ultimately, how do we solve this complex issue, or is it even solvable? We also have included a question and answer session in the second half of the event so that you can ask your, your questions to the panelists. We understand that the topic that is addressed today is sensitive and controversial. We ask you to remain respectful of the speakers, the organizers, and the audience around you. We hope that today's event will result in a healthy discussion and dialogue that will allow us to move forward as a community and to better understand what is happening around us. In terms of the question and answer period, there will be um, sheets going around for anybody who would like to write their questions down. They can indicate which panelist they want to answer the question to or whether the question wants to be, um, or whether you want the question addressed by all panelists. Also, there will be an opportunity for asking live questions. So if that's what you want to do, just make sure that you raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a mic. So we will be welcoming our three guest speakers who are experts on the topic of radicalization, violent radicalization each one of whom will give an individual talk, followed by a question and answer section. So, to begin, Faisal Kutti is an associate professor of law and a director of the international LMM program at Valparaiso University Law School in Indiana and an adjunct professor at Osgoode Hall Law School of York University in Toronto. He is a co-founder and currently serves as counsel to KSM Law a Toronto-based law firm. During his 18-year legal career, he has acted for and represented dozens of individuals and institutions caught up in anti-terror investigations and matters. He co-founded and served as general counsel for the Canadian Muslim Civil Liberties Association while still a law student. He also co-founded and served as vice chair and legal counsel to the Canadian chapter of the Council of American Islamic Relations, now known as the National Council of Canadian Muslims, and CCM. He also served as an Islamic law and culture consultant for The Little Mosque on Prairie, an award-winning internationally acclaimed sitcom on the, Canadi on, on the CBC. He is a regular commentator on anti-terrorism law, national security, Islamic law, constitutional law, human rights, and Muslims. His articles and interviews have appeared in numerous academic and non-academic publications and media outlets around the world. He also blogs at the Huffington Post. Faisal, has also been ranked as one of the top 500 most influential Muslims in the world. Considering there's over one billion, that's pretty cool. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for that long, detailed introduction. I specifically didn't want you to mention that 500 most influential, because I don't know what that means. Uh, anyway, I don't even have influence with my own wife, so. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, if you can just let me know when I have five minutes and then one minute. Because my wife says once I start talking, that's it. So, and if I don't stop, I give permission to the RCMP officer to use their taser on me. So they have permission. Just so that we can put the audience out of its misery. Anyway, so. I'd like to talk about an issue. Before I talk about this, I want to just put some perspective. Okay, we're here to talk about an issue which is an important issue, but at the same time, let's have some perspective. The perspective is the average Canadian still has a higher chance of, or the average North American has a higher chance of drowning in their own bathtub and dying 
rather than being targeted by a terrorist. Okay? So let's put that into perspective. Or to fall off your bed and die. But we don't have a Department of National Prevention of Falling Off Beds. Right? Because there's, of course, there's reasons for that. That said, you know, uh, violent radicalization is a problem. It's a problem that we must deal with because it impacts on a lot of people. It impacts on everyone. When one of these crazies goes and commits a violent crime, it impacts not only the innocent individuals killed, but it impacts even, you know, the, the, what, what I would call the innocent Muslim community. Because what happens? Everybody targets you. So everybody has, a, has an interest in trying to solve this problem. Now, there's been numerous studies on how to do this and what to do about de-radicalization. Now, de-radicalization, I, I want to take issue with that term, first of all. I think we should be focusing not on de-radicalization, but on disengaging people from violence. What's the difference? And why do I say that? Well, let's look at, if I can get the mouse to move. Um, maybe that, uh, that paper? I think it's not picking up. Try this. Sure. Okay. That's better, thanks. Okay, process of radicalization. Yeah, that's better for me. I prefer that. Thank you. Is this better? Okay. So, the process of radicalization and violence is highly idiosyncratic. What does that mean? It's very individualistic. There's no one, one way that somebody's radicalized. There's various things that have to happen. They include a complex interaction of personal, social, economic, political, and ideological factors. Process and reasons for violence are circumstance-driven and sometimes even opportunistic. And they're basically a competition going on between these two sides. Okay, so we see that all the time. Now, what has to happen? There's a bunch of things that have to be there in order for radicalization to happen. And my argument is, and many uh, terrorism experts have talked about this, that really maybe we shouldn't be focusing on de-radicalization as much as it's a disengaging from violence. Because I may have radical ideas. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi was considered radical. Nelson Mandela was a radical. Martin Luther King was a radical. The world would be a very different place if we didn't have radicals. So we don't necessarily need to de-radicalize. What we want to do is get people to say, look, you don't go to violence. So how does this happen? Why does this process of de-radicalization self, uh, self take place? Number one, there are reasons. Foreign policy. So our government or our Western governments are seen to be doing certain things, okay, attacking Muslims, whether it's directly, indirectly, through acquiescence, or facilitating it, and then domestic policies, anti-terror laws, for instance. Some of them have unintended consequences. Many people may be on no-fly lists. In our office, we constantly get people saying, you know, they're on no-fly lists, they can't fly, they can't travel to the United States, and I don't know what I did. Through the use of secret evidence, which you can't challenge or contest, right? People are added to lists, and there's a proliferation of lists. I'm on a list. I can't send packages, and I wrote an op-ed a few years ago about this. I can't send packages from Toronto to Peterborough a certain time because I'm on some kind of a list that Homeland Security keeps. So my question is, really, do we want Homeland Security in the United States to be able to control what I can send from Toronto to Peterborough? Right? What does that, why does that happen? Because there's cross-fertilization of lists, and it's very complex. And my topic today is not about that. But there's many domestic policies that impact on people, right? My father, many of you may have read many years ago, he was traveling to the United States to deliver a talk, saying that there's no place for uh, violence in Islam. That was the subject. He was detained, taken off a plane, interrogated. We didn't know where he was. We got the media involved. And then eventually he got released, sent back, saying he was a member of a suspected or, uh, terrorist organization. What was a suspected terrorist organization? The largest Muslim organization in North America. Right? And I took this affidavit that they got him to sign and sent it to the legal counsel for the 
largest Muslim organization in North America, Islamic Society of North America, which that year, right, had conferences with 30,000 people across from the White House. Yet, my father, because he had a business card saying Islamic Society of North America was taken up. Why? These are domestic policies, whether in the United States or Canada, that impact on people. And you know what people came to me after and said? I said, see, it's a war against, look how liberal your dad is. Look how moderate your, your dad is. And yet he was targeted. So it's really a war against Islam and Muslims. And my response is, no, it's not. These are unintended consequences. And we live in a democracy. We can challenge those things. Right? We can question them. We can debate them. We, need to, we can file lawsuits. We have different avenues. But those grievances are used by extremists to say, look, they're actually targeting every single Muslim. Why, Faisal, can't you? You're, you're a peaceful guy. Why can't you send a package? Because you know what I did with that package? Instead of using my account number, which they said I couldn't use because I was on a list, I took the same bomb that I had, walked over to the UPS, didn't use my account number, paid cash, and sent my bomb. So I wrote an op-ed saying, look, really this list is ineffective because I could send my bomb as long as I don't use my account number. Which terrorist is going to use their account number? Right? So you use these opportunities to rectify and to correct the problem. But extremists will say, look, see, they're after every single Muslim. So grievances, just to give you some examples. So there's foreign policy as well as domestic policy. These radical, violent radicals exploit this and will talk to young people and say, look, they're after every single Muslim. They're after, so we need to be able to challenge that. The second thing that has to happen, so grievances, everybody has grievances. Lots of people have grievances. But not everybody who has a grievance goes to violence. That ideo ideology comes into the picture. Whether it's a political ideology, somebody says, I have a political ideology. And there was a survey done by the United States Institute for Peace of 2,000 uh, suicide bombers, uh, or you know, failed suicide bombers. And the study found that they had very little knowledge of Islam. And many studies have proven this. And why were they doing this? For political reasons. So it wasn't necessarily religion. It was a political ideology that was driving them. So you take grievances, you take political ideology, you have people in each of those circles. But still, people with grievances, or people with this political ideology, they don't all commit violent offenses. Okay? Then you have people who say, well, you know what, Muslims don't need to apologize. Yes, we shouldn't. In normal circumstances, we don't need to apologize. We don't need to explain. Unfortunately, the ground realities out there is such that Islamophobes are out there actively saying, Islam teaches this, Islam teaches that. So we as members of a civil society have a duty to tell our neighbors, look, Islam doesn't teach these things. Islam doesn't stand for you. Because I get this all the time. Why do we have to keep apologizing? Yes, I believe we don't... Does, does the Italian community always have to apologize when the Mafia does something? No, nobody expects them to. Because we know it's just a fringe. But when it comes to the Muslims, the same should apply. But unfortunately, the ground realities are such that the Islamophobes and people with interests are out there promoting and pummeling this idea on the masses that Islam teaches this. Muslims believe this. So we, as members of a civil society, have to say, no, it doesn't. But there are interpretations of Islam, unfortunately, that some uncritically adopt, okay, that can be used to, uh, to commit crimes. Really, these are crimes. I don't like to use the term terrorism. These are violent offenses. These are crimes. Because terrorism, the use of that has a con political connotation. Because you heard that expression, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Because you can use this term interchangeably, right? But these are violent crimes. And they use religion. And so, yes, the Muslim community has a role to challenge these interpretations, to contextualize these verses. There are some verses in the Quran which you can read to say this is what you do. But what's the context? And is it really applicable today? It, was it a different scenario that was existing at the time? Is it talking about self-defense? Does it not say when you know, the other side retreats, you should, and, and can it just anybody go and declare jihad? All of these things have to be, it's a role of the Muslim community to educate our youth about that in our community. So, so you have ideology, whether it's political or religious. Then you have mobilizers. So you could have grievances, you could have ideology, but then somebody has to instigate that. Usually there's a, 
a, a, a charismatic, articulate preacher. So Anwar Awlaki, I remember people used to come to me and say, oh, he's such a great speaker, great scholar. He does wonderful things about Islamic history. And I listened to a couple. They said, yeah, but some of his stuff is really crazy. And then, of course, he went to quote, totally wacko. And he started calling for the death of Americans and Canadians and, you know, all these, and it became political. Yet because he had legitimacy, because he was teaching Islamic history, it rolled into this, and he had a lot of followers. So you have grievances, you have ideology, and then you have this radical, very charismatic speaker who can... So in UK they say four people, four radical preachers radicalized all the people who went overseas. Some of them have been arrested and various things have happened to them, but these are four core people. They use a manipulated religion. Anwar al many people didn't know that he was doing this and he was preaching these extreme ideas and radical ideas and he was such a great scholar in, in the minds of some. He'd been arrested multiple times for soliciting prostitution. Right? So all of these, so what, what was his real agenda? Was it really about Islam? Or he had other, other things, right? So when people uncritically accept these charismatic scholars as, you know, wow, this great, he speaks really great. So we as a community need to be able to challenge that. Social groups, a bunch of guys. It's always, even the Toronto 18, if you talk to them, a couple of them have started to speak out now, they're in jail. They started to speak out, they say, well, this is a bunch of guys. And they would only hang around with those bunch of guys. No more interaction with other multicultural diversity, different people. They only click to themselves. And then they start talking about grievances, whether domestic, foreign, ideology. Then they have this charismatic preacher that they're listening to. And then they cling together. So all that fuels it. But again, even with all these, you may not resort to violence yet. Then now you throw into the mix the fourth thing here. If I can get it to move. The personal issues, be it mental issues in some cases, failure in life, they have no real purpose in life, they have nothing to lose. So you have all of these things coming into the mix here. Now, there could be people in all of these groups but they don't resort to violence. But you can see, when they all connect here in the middle, it's a very small group. It's not proportionate here, of course. But it's a very tiny, tiny group that actually commit these acts. So how do we get to them? That's what we're here for, right? Well, instead of blaming, let's say, the foreign policy, which many Muslims do, or some people in the government, only Muslims, it's a multi-pronged approach. We can point fingers at each other all night long, all day long, weeks long, but we'll never solve this problem. But if everybody does their role, which is the, you know, the community has to do its role to identify individuals who are like this, possibly counsel them, right? Society has to also think about, we, we as a broader society, not a Muslim society, but a broader society, we also glorify violence. You know, gang culture, gun culture, all of these things like this. So it's really, this is an issue for me of youth crime prevention. And I think it's a, it's a sellable idea, even to the community, that this is really about some youth who are going astray, and we can all work on it together rather than pointing fingers and blaming. And various people have come up with different types of ideas on this, but if you look at Liverpool University did kind of a great on this. I don't necessarily agree with everything on here, but it's a good starting point. So you can see when level one concern is when there's negative peer influence, gang involvement, criminality, hate-linked violence, period of perceived Western hedonistic correct behavior. A lot of these guys who who end up following this route, have a period where they get into all these bad things. Then they start feeling guilty. Okay? Then conflict with family or religious beliefs because they become much more fanatical, much more rigid. But that doesn't mean it's, 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 it's wrong. And this is where my problem is. If we start saying, I want to de-radicalize, then you, you, you attack, you basically undermine them by saying, yeah, none of your grievances are legitimate. You know, you have to think standard. What standard? In a democracy, we can have dissent, we can have differences, and we should be allowed to do that. It's when you cross into hate, you violate criminal code, or you, you, you cross into criminal conduct, or you associate with criminals. Police have to use law enforcement tools and 
get involved. So the first level is where community has to be involved. Lack of knowledge combined with increased observance. Okay? Because every study shows that they had very little bit of knowledge. Remember the group that went from UK? They were reading Islam for Idiots or something. They want to learn about the religion. And there's actually studies that show they know very little about the religion. I've been confronted when I go speak on this. They come talk to me, they come debate me on Islamic law. And then I realized very quickly, you know nothing. You don't even know how Islamic law is formed. So how could you even have this argument with me? You don't even have the foundations. But they're very proud. You know, this is a, the hadith says this. How many hadiths are there? How do you interpret a hadith? What kind of levels of uh, authenticity is given to a hadith? Who is Imam Abu Hanifa? They'll cite these schools. Who are these schools? Were they prophets? Or were they interpreters? They're just human beings who've interpreted the Quran and hadith or life of the prophet. But these are, not these are not divine. These are interpretation and we can reinterpret them because we're human beings just like them. They were not prophets. They were not divine. So when you start questioning these things, this is where number one is. And I've counseled a couple of people who they'll sit and listen and they, just, they realize they don't know much. And then you point them to go, go and read this. Really, who is Imam Bukhari? He's supposedly someone who came many years later after the Prophet and compiled these hadiths. So really, you really think they're 100% accurate and they're exactly the way the Prophet said? Or could there be different ways of reading this? Could there be different interpretation? Could this be misconstrued? Because you'll even see hadith, for instance, one version of it will say, for, let me give you an example, it's a simple hadith. The hadith says that a woman, one version says a prostitute who gave water to a, a dog was saved from hell. Another version says it's a bad woman. Another version says something else. So which version? But the message is the person who saved, who's, okay, who saved the dog okay, was saved by God. But the details of it, there's differences and different schools differ on these things. So when you start engaging with them at that level, so let me go through this very quickly. Active intervention, monitoring. So at the first level, maybe there's not too much concern. The second level, we need more intervention, more, uh, and, and I can send this to people if you want. You can email me, I'll send this, because I have to wrap up here. Number three is when you need to report to law enforcement, when they actually cross the line. So it has to be a team effort here, right? That the law enforcement has to be involved when they cross the line into these things here. And I, I don't have time to read through them, but I'll, I can send this to you. But this is something, if we're on the same page with all sectors of, 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 of community, of society, we could solve this problem, right? But it has to be a concerted effort where we're seen as part of a team. Where, and you cannot be seen as a de, this de-radicalization, because that's dangerous. Because people will say, oh, you mean my, claim, my, my grievances are not, you know, your, your grievances are totally legitimate. But there's different ways to deal with it, rather than saying, you're radical. And we need to be careful radical. And we don't want to racially profile. One of the things that happens when you say, oh, everybody in this ideology, guilt by association happens. I've had many people in my office, they're being interviewed because they know someone who's someone who's someone. Right? Network, they, they do something called uh, uh, your, your network analysis. They analyze your, uh, networks, your, your network, who are you engaging with, who are you interacting with. You know, it has to be very carefully done because otherwise guilt by association, right? Because at the end of the day, I, I remember first, and then the thesis has improved significantly, but the first, immediately right after 9-11, and I'll wrap up with this, I remember some thesis agents came to my office to interview someone, okay? And I wrote a letter to the thesis at the time. I said, hey, hey guys, you guys need a little bit better training, right? Because a person was interviewed, and they insisted this person was in, was, was, knew a terrorist, or an alleged suspect, or whatever, okay, a target. The person, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't know what you're talking about. And he was right, and so were the intelligence. Right? What was the issue here? Because they had photographs of this guy hugging this target. And the hugging was happening in Eid. So I said to the agent, I hug like hundreds of people at Eid. Say Eid Mubarak. I have no idea 90% of them I hugged. But if you take a picture, and five years later it comes in, you have a picture, you, you're hugging this guy. You must know this guy. They've improved a lot. Okay, but just giving you an example, and at that time I ended up writing a letter saying, look, you, this, is, this is very shoddy. I've also, for instance, okay, uh, I remember filing a charitable application for an organization, and the charity was denied. I didn't do it. Some non-Muslim lawyer filed this application and it was denied. 
And the non-Muslim lawyer referred the matter to our office, because maybe these guys know, because Revenue Canada had written a long letter. And one of the objections was, we're going to deny you charity status because it says you will follow the Salaf al-Saleh. So they had interpreted this as meaning they're Salafi Muslims. But first of all, what's wrong with being a Salafi Muslim? Not all Salafis believe in violence. But besides that point, they interpreted that as, oh, Salaf al-Saleh means Salafi. So I wrote a long detailed letter saying, a Salaf al-Saleh is the disciples of the Prophet. Every Muslim says they're trying to be the, like the Salaf al-Saleh. So if you deny charitable status to an organization who says they'll be following the teachings of the Salaf al-Saleh, that's problematic. Right? So this kind of stuff, you know, this guilt by association, this overgeneralization, that can only be solved if we engage with law enforcement, if we engage with our government. Right? So we can't be seeing each other as enemies. And so this last point is, and then we can deal with it in question. Okay, I would just get you guys to read some of these materials, since you're all university students. Cutting the Feud by Robert Pate, Dying to Win Robert Pate, University of Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism, The Psychology of Terrorism by John Gordon, Center for Terrorism and Security Studies at the University of Massachusetts, The Missing Martyrs, Why There Are So Few Muslim Terrorists, Professor Charles Crisman, Triangle Center. And then the last one is a fatwa, a fatwa on Terrorism. And the Duke Center also has a profile of a listing of all the fatwas, because every time I speak, we say, why don't Muslims condemn terrorism? We've been condemning terrorism forever, but we don't have a soapbox to, to, to freely distribute these things. We don't have the resources. We don't have the organizations that can do that. So it's there if you want to go and look, right? So to blame the Muslim community, unfortunately, you know, it, it doesn't solve the problem. It just makes you uh, the, create that siege mentality, which I see happening, unfortunately. Many Muslims, even when they know I'm coming to talk about it, they're like, really? Aren't, don't you think it's all, it's all the government is creating this? No, the government's not creating it. The government may be exaggerating it sometimes, okay? But there is a problem. And it, if we're not part of the solution, the problem will become bigger. So we have an obligation, and I end with that, we have an obligation as members of a civil society in a democratic society, we have to stand up for our rights, we have to demand our rights, but at the same time we have to carry our responsibilities. So it's seek our rights and make sure the government, law enforcement follow the rules, the rule of law, the constitution, but we also have to do our part, which is to make sure we're responsible, that if we know somebody who's up to these things, it's our religious and legal obligation to bring it to the attention of people who are equipped to deal with it. That doesn't mean if somebody has a different opinion from you, all of a sudden you call them. And, and that, I think, we need to figure out a way at what stage this is done. And that Liverpool uh, chart there is a, is a good starting point. With that, I will end. Thank you very much for listening. Just to follow up with our next speaker, thank you for that. So, our uh, second speaker for the night is Muhammad Robert Hecht. He is the founder for the P4E support group, um, a, a group that um, focuses on de-radicalization and counter and he's a de-radicalization and counterterrorism expert. Coming from a German and Irish background, Hef spent his childhood and the majority of his life in a small town outside of Toronto. Hef converted to Islam in 1998, after which he studied Islam with qualified scholars for over seven years. He began his community involvement in 2003, and since then has gone on to take part in a variety of government and community initiatives. In 2007, um, Robert Hef was made a representative representative for the Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum Humanitarian and Charity, Humanitarian and Charity Establishment for all of Canada, and he holds this position today. In 2008, he started the Stop Terrorism Cause, which is a global and online cause claiming to have over 20,000 members. In 2009, have formally started working with his youth at risk and designed a three-step de-radicalization program for Muslim Canadians. Through this program, he has helped many youth who have turned towards radicalization and brought them away from this destructive state. <clears throat> Judge Dawson approved in 2009 
2010 as a de-radicalization counselor in for Stephen Vikash Chant, one of the Toronto 18 arrested for the involvement in the 2006 Ontario terrorism plot. Sorry about that. A few more words. He continues to support government agencies on efforts of de-radicalization and is here today to talk about all the work that he's done. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks for having me and um, you know, great to be in Windsor. I haven't been here in uh, quite a long time. In fact, back in the day I, I used to be at the Casino Windsor and I hear it's not doing so well anymore because of the competition with the United States. Um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to be here and uh, you know, I, I, really wanna, I really wanna commend everyone for coming. I know it's not easy. I, I do a lot of stuff in the media and sometimes you see a 30 second sound bite and what is he saying? Um, I'd like to agree with, uh, with Faisal, uh, Brother Faisal, about what he's saying. I think terminology is extremely important and sometimes de-radicalization can be a, an exploited word and disengagement is probably better because I'm in fact radical. You can quote me Tarek Fatah. Um, the fact remains that Radicalization in itself, as has already been discussed, isn't a problem. It's a problem when we follow do-it-yourself Islam. Um, I have to make it clear. I mean, I, I've sat with people who have the ISIS ideology. I, I've been involved for about 10 years before it became popular to, to run events and to uh, accept that we do have a few imbeciles in our community. And it's like a cult status, but really, in fairness to them, they, they really do believe they're deriving their rulings from Islam, so it, it's not really helpful if we just keep saying, they're not Muslim, they're this, they're that. They think they're Muslim. They're not good Muslims. Uh, we can call them the, the Khawarj, we can call them what we want, but they are deriving their ideas from what they believe to be authentic sources. So it's really important that we kind of a, accept that they are trying to do that. Whether they have mental health issues, which I found a lot of them do, they definitely don't have very much knowledge in the religion, that's pretty obvious. They have political grievances, and in fairness to um, Imam Anwar al a lot of his views became rigid after he was arrested and put in Yemen, in jail, and he was tortured. And after he came out, he became even more rigid than he was before. And I think that's the case. Not making excuses because I don't follow him or believe he was uh, on the right path in his ideas, but I think fair is fair. A lot of these things are happening because Muslims are being mistreated and they're looking for a way to grieve. And these people in particular that we're working on, they're grieving through an extreme brutality and violence and make no mistakes about it. They don't believe anybody's Muslim but them. Uh, the Taliban, who would be considered a terrorist group by Canadian authorities, they're also not Muslim according to them. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda's group in in Syria also is not Muslim according to them. I liked um, one of the quotes uh, from Imam Ali who, when he spoke about the people who raised the black flag and some of their significant um, features and, and they were including that they would have like girl hair. I used to have it. it. I went through that stage too. And I call it the Khalifa complex. Like we come into the religion and we get praised so much like we're the solution to all the world's problems because we pray five times a day, that people start looking up to us and we start to get prideful. I mean, there was a time where, uh, you know, the devil came to me and tried to convince me that I was going to save the world. And until you can be put in your place and realize that you're only part of the, pu the puzzle and you're not the whole solution, it's, it's very difficult. You start to get arrogant and prideful and think you're going to do something. As far as the work I do, um, I think one thing that's really important is that what we have a problem here is, it, it, it comes about trust and, and solution. And the trust I'm talking about is, there are two extremes. One is what I call the Tea Party, you know, in the Canadian government, and people who would like everyone to believe that we're like, -ha -ha, we're out to get everyone. And then there's the extreme in our community who believes everybody is out to get us. So I'd like to think most of us, or all of us in the room are kind of in the middle, trying to navigate through things and trying to keep things in perspective. So I will say that 130 people overseas joining ISIS is 130 people too much or too many. But that doesn't mean that out of the million Muslims that this call by ISIS has been 
attracting millions of people around the world. In fact, if we're 1.6 billion strong, even if they're attracting 1,000 or 1,500 mercenaries every month, it doesn't mean it's necessarily a global crisis. The problem is that once you get into that mentality, it's extremely difficult to fix it. And when a Canadian does go over there, it becomes a problem in that, what if they do come back? And when they do come back, you have to understand that their ideology is they're at war. And they can lie when they're at war. So how do we trust them that they're going to come back and not become, for example, a sleeper cell and wait five or ten years and go spray some bullets in a shopping, a shopping center? Because it's very clear they do believe that this is permissible. Where's my phone? Ah, uh, see? Now, what is, the, what is the solution to all of this? Nobody has one solution. Everybody has their opinion. I have my opinion. Some things that I've done have been successful. Uh, I'm a Sunni Muslim. I believe in the Quran and Sunnah. I believe in Islamic law. I'm not here to apologize for being a, a fundamentalist, quote unquote. I'm in fact proud of following Islamic law. That's what keeps Canada safe. The problem is when you follow a law that's interpreted by do-it-yourselfers, that's where we all have a problem collectively. And so we're trying to fix that. At the center, I run a good citizen program. Whether people even know what's going on or not, when they're coming in, we make sure they have a balanced understanding of the religion. We try to make sure they get proper social services, which is extremely important. I found over the last 10 years, when you win some of these people over by caring about them, new Muslims and newly practicing Muslims who are overzealous, then they can come to you sometimes and feel a little bit of concern when they get riled in by some of these politically or ideologically driven people in the community who think that they're going to solve all the world's problems in 24 hours. Now what ends up happening is, I show by the work I do. So I'll give you an example. Why have I gotten to a position where policing authorities accept me? Is it because I'm a paid agent? Or is it because that in 2005, four months prior to CSIS infiltrating the Toronto 18, I was the one who put them on the trail of the Toronto 18? Maybe that has something to do with the trust factor. Maybe the fact that I don't take money from any of the agencies and I don't believe the government should pay our community to, in fact, be part of the solution. Maybe that builds trust with the police and community. Maybe the fact that when people get arrested and it looks a little bit dicey and nobody wants to touch it, I go and offer to bail them out because I believe some of them are being entrapped. I believe some of them are being exploited. Some of them in the Toronto 18, quite, ang quite frankly, were arrested because they casted the net wide, as far as I'm concerned. But there were individuals there who wanted to do stuff, and I, I counsel, and they have reached out to me, not blaming Mubin Sheikh, although I have a problem with the taking the money idea, but I don't have the problem in trying to keep Canada safe, and that's what I believe Mubin tried to do. So following 2006, and I, did, I missed a big point. How do I even understand this mentality? Because I was recruited by a group, Takfril Hidra, back in the year 2000, prior to getting married. And, or, sorry, shortly after getting married. And what ended up happening is this Egyptian fellow who came here and married somebody locally so he could take the citizenship, who CSIS is watching, and he's still in Canada, he started filling my, my head with ideas that it was okay to lie, steal, and cheat, and that we're in a perpetual war. Now, thank God I never lied, stealed, and cheated anyone, and that was the point I got out. But his ideology is much equal to that of ISIS. And they came as political refugees, and I'd like to say this, not every Muslim ruler who kicked somebody out of their country necessarily was good for Canada. Some of them came here and have exploited the Canadian citizenship to, in fact, spew their ideas and try to cause havoc around the world. Now, after getting through them, I was in Iraq in 2003. I was really upset. The Americans, you know, they screwed up big time. They went there for their interests. They went there to take out Saddam Hussein. But in fact, millions of people have died. The whole war has been a disaster. And indirectly, it's caused a grievance because of the government that's come into power, which are the Maliki government, who then have been attacking the Sunnis and created a huge divide in Iraq. So America has a lot to do with a lot of the grievances that are coming. So I can say that. Why? Because it's true. The fact of the matter is, I was there, and some of the people I were there with were like ISIS. I was on the bus with somebody, and a Christian from Poland was on the bus with us, and he was coming to become a human shield. And I sat with a guy from Kazakhstan. 
He had a, a, a Yemeni knife with him. He wanted to slit the throat of the Christian who was coming to defend the fact that they thought it was an unjust war. So please don't tell me that we don't have our crazies. I was in between a mediator trying to tell him, what are you doing? And he trusted me. So thank God he didn't kill him. But he had no problem thinking that just because he was a Christian, he didn't value the work he was doing for them. And that goes with Alan Henning and other individuals who have been killed or crucified or, or maimed by this ISIS group. We should be looking at them as Abu Talibs, people who were like the Prophet's uncle, peace be upon him. They didn't necessarily accept Islam, but nobody can tell me the Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't care and love them. He called them to Islam up until the last breath. And Abu Talib fought and bled, and he was not Muslim. So you're telling me there's no Abu Talib? No, Canada's our Abu Talib. Although we disagree with some of the policies, this is our tribe. These are our people. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us. And we're trying to win them over. But how do we win them over? You have to build trust. The media has gone in some ways extreme, but a lot of the media is good. So you can't say they're all bad. But we can say there's a political agenda, but they're not all bad. Former MP Derek Lee, he flew with me to Dubai to convince the Emir of Dubai to support our organization. Now, don't think that was easy for him. If I said one stupid thing in the media, his political career was gone. The RCMP, they've aligned with people like myself, not endorsing us, keeping at us at, at an arm's length. They can't endorse anybody's Islam. They can only work with all the communities, the Ahmadiyyas, the Shias, the Sunnis, the different sects of all of them, because they all say they're Muslim. I have theological differences with them, but we all agree on safety, so we can work in that context. And then outside of that, we can keep our arguments and discussions for small rooms where we can debate who's the real Muslim or not. But as long as we're all on that page, I think that's the most important thing to all Canadians. They're not caring whether you cover or not. We can't buy into the propaganda. There was a great video that was done. I think everyone saw it when I was in Qatar. And the, the person, that's the Canada I know. Because I've dressed like this for 12 years, every day, except for when I swim. And I can count on my hand how many times I've been insulted in Canada. So don't tell me about Islamophobia, because I'm like a woman in the sense that a woman who wears the hijab knows what I'm talking about. Because I wear a uniform that identifies me, and I don't care how you dress, this is not a, a propaganda of my, my dress, but I know how it feels. And I'm telling you, most Canadians, the vast majority, are great people who have no issue with how we dress, whether we play hockey or not. They just want to know about safety. That's what the RCMP wants. I was just at the Ontario Police College for an hour and a half telling them what I believe, and they have no issue with it. Working in Edmonton with the police, the Toronto Police, CSIS. How come if they don't have an issue with it, but they're not the ones directing, it's the policies. So we have to get into the policies and make those changes. I don't know how long I've talked. Okay, then I'm doing okay. The via, via rail of the rest. Okay, I'll tell you what I have a problem with that is. The problem I have is, I know the father. He came to me. And he went to the mosque after the arrest. The mosque that was the one who turned him in. I know who the person is. And when he went to that mosque, he asked them for help. They actually tried to make him believe that it was someone else who turned in their son. Hmm. They didn't own it. They don't own it. They just want it because the person was not Somalian. It was very easy for them to turn him over. But it's very difficult. I married into the community, by the way, so I'm not speaking out of ignorance. It's very difficult for them to call in on their own people. But when they called in on Raya Jasser and they ended up doing a great service, when the arrest took place, they didn't own it. So when I came forward trying to say, well, this is good for the Muslims, of course it looked like I was the one who called it in. But I, in fact, tried to bail him out of jail. Why? Because his father went around the community and nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody wanted to help him. And I tried to put up my house. And I got raked over the coals by the prosecutor. But the point is, you can't be an agent and a bail surety. You can't do it all. The fact of the matter is that we as a community, when we feel that they've overstepped their bounds, hold them to account, get involved. But just to say it's all, not, it's all made up, it's not all made up. It's exploited, but it's not made up. But to save one life is like to save all of humanity. 
So I think it's well worth it. And it's well worth it to do it for free. But when we were talking, you are mentioning about um, having that sort of point, I, I call it the imminence. If somebody comes up to you and says they don't like George Bush, you don't have to call CSIS or the RCMP. My aunt's not Muslim, she doesn't like George Bush. But if somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, I want to do something, I've got a knife or I've got a gun, I'm going to go across the street and I'm going to do something. If you can and you have the strength, stop them, but also, that point, call the police. If somebody's having just a grievance against the government, that, there's nothing wrong with that. But if they start to espouse that they want to enact violence, vigilante violence, then you have a concern with them. So we have to have that point. And one point I want to make with the RCMP is, everybody says, why doesn't CSIS come to me? I, I know Christina Boudreau, whose son Damien got killed in, in Syria. And I told her, CSIS can't come to someone over the age of 18, father or mother, and tell them that we all have rights. We can't, they can't come there and say, your son we think is a radical, he might do something. It's not that easy. Once you commit a crime, it's much easier for them to now come and reach out. But for them, there's constitutional issues. There's charters, there's laws against that. So what do you want them to do? You can't, we can't have our cake and it too. We have to police our own community as best we can, even though, you know, like I said, some of these things can be exploited. I was recently, I'll finish with this, I was recently uh, in Qatar, and you'll hear about this, but just to show how the, the so-called experts in the media want to exploit things, I met with the, the head of the Taliban embassy. And when I sat with them, I, I, I mentioned to him that I don't agree with their way of suicide bombing, and, and I, I had a good conversation with him. He didn't speak very good English. Ironically enough, he asked me, could I get him to Canada? Uh, you know, everybody wants to come to Canada, even the Taliban, what can I say? It's a great country. So they told me, I said, listen, what if we put together a, a, a treaty? I don't agree with your ideology, but perhaps if you said something about the people in North America and Western countries that, that Mullah Omar and the Taliban don't agree with vigilante violence, it would cause doubt between the narratives between ISIS and, 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 and their group and Al-Qaeda. Maybe enough doubt that we can catch somebody in Canada before they do something like what happened in Ottawa. So maybe I'm an idealist, maybe I'm a, a pragmatist in that sense, but I thought it was great. Now somebody tried to exploit it, oh, we got to tell Ottawa he sat with terrorists. I got a text message from the RCMP, good luck with that treaty. Do you understand, like, I have a good relationship with them because I'm transparent, and I'm out for the safety of Canada, but I proved it. So there's a little bit more, and, and I, I spoke to them, they're under a lot of pressure for coming here, because there's people that want to derail these kinds of events on both sides. And you have to commend them for coming because it isn't easy. Because everyone they're associated with, they're also thrown under the bus. Don't think the RCMP don't get their share of bad media press. So I think right now, we should thank, because we're Muslims and because we're thankful for Canada, let's thank Superintendent Doug Best for not listening to the naysayers and coming out with people who have practical solutions. Please give them takbir. And, and I mean that, because I know what you guys go through. I get it on the other side. So thank you very much. And uh, I just wanted to rant. Because really, at the end of the day, each one of us has our solutions within their own community. But the most important is keeping Canada safe because we're Muslims. I'm a Muslim first. And I'm not going to apologize for that. Countries come and go. My faith in God, inshallah, will never go. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Great insight into uh, understanding how youth in Canada have been at least uh, ad their, their radicalization has been addressed in the community. We need more of you, <laughs> definitely. Our third speaker for the night is RCMP uh, Doug Bast. His, his position is known as the Assistant Criminal Operations Officer of the National Security of RCMP. Um, Doug Best is a graduate of the Memorial University of Newfoundland and he has two undergrad undergraduate degrees with a grad degree in administration. He began as an officer in 1977 in Toronto and he joined the RCMP Security Service in 1981, which later became known as CSIS. He returned to the RCMP in 1996. He is assigned to the Air India Investigation, where he was the lead investigator and operations officer. 
He, commissioned, he was commissioned in 2006 and took a variety of senior roles in the national security, protective, protective operations, and border integrity in British Columbia before assuming his current role. Particularly proud of his collaborative work with national and international partner agencies, um, Doug Fast is here to talk about the RCMP's role in the United States. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I just first we want to uh, take this opportunity to say how pleased I am uh, to have the opportunity to be here, and a uh, big thank you to the uh, Muslim Student Association of the University of Windsor, and uh, as I said, uh, we always uh, very much welcome the opportunity to come and participate in such dialogue. Uh, Surprisingly enough, uh, I guess when you hear what I have to say here in a moment, you will see that there will be tremendous similarity to what has already been said. And uh, it certainly wasn't scripted, and uh, at least we didn't have the occasion to uh, uh, prepare notes before, uh, or compare notes, I should say, before we arrived. So, uh, the RCMP and, uh, and its role in this, in this whole uh, situation we find ourselves in. Well, uh, as was pointed out, I am the Assistant Criminal Operations Officer and I'm responsible for uh, all national security investigations in the province of Ontario, save for uh, Ottawa and uh, a couple of places to the north. So that means uh, we're very busy. What I also would like to say is that, you know, we have what are called INSETs, and that's Integrated National Security Enforcement Teams. And they're generally located in major uh, cities uh, across the country. For example, in Vancouver, in Edmonton, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. In other areas of the country, we have smaller units that, uh, that embark upon these investigations for us. What I want to really, I guess, point out most importantly is that, short cord. Uh, most importantly is that really, uh, where is our emphasis? And I can promise you that our emphasis really, uh, as unfortunate as it may seem, oftentimes we find ourselves in an enforcement role where we really like to place our emphasis on, is on the side of prevention. And that is why we very much enjoy the opportunity to work with all the communities, all communities. And I think, you know, there's been some criticism in the past that, uh, the RCMP uh, is targeting communities. I can promise you we are not targeting communities. What we do target is criminality. And if, you know, wherever the criminality occurs, that's where we will be. But I think before, you know, activities cross the threshold of becoming criminal, there's a huge role to play in the prevention piece. And I can promise you that as a, as a senior police officer, I would be very delighted if I could sit here and stand in front of you today and say, we'll never have to prosecute another case of terrorism again in this country. That would be ideal. Unfortunately, circumstances may dictate otherwise. But to the points that were, that were raised here this evening, it's really through this dialogue with the communities and building the trust, and you know, we're not naive. We realize that we have many people who come from different countries around the world. Where, quite frankly, the last person on earth you would ever approach would approach would be a police officer or a law enforcement officer. So we understand that. So it's important that we have this dialogue, this two-way dialogue, that we build the trust, build the rapport, so that people know that they can they can trust, and they know that we really would. Uh, like to be able to prevent these acts occurring before they, they do. And when I say that, uh, I think I'm pretty much echoing what has been said, is that really, truly, we all have an obligation, the police have an obligation, but you as a community also have a large obligation, community leaders, religious leaders, social workers, Department of Education, Health, everybody has a piece to play in this. And for whatever reason, a young person, be it male or female, becomes disenfranchised. It may be that the individual can get put back on the correct track uh, and uh, not embark upon or, or take their thoughts and bring it to a form where it becomes actionable and they wish to carry out an act of violence. 
I guess I may go back to the point raised earlier. We are not the thought police. You know, well, this is a free country. You're free to have whatever idea you may wish. It's when you act upon ideologies uh, that where you want to create a uh, violent act against innocent people, that's when it crosses into the, uh, crosses the threshold of criminality. So uh, again, if I, if I just may, I won't go on much longer. I'm certainly glad to be welcome any questions that you may have afterwards. But uh, I very much uh, personally enjoy, and certainly through our outreach program, through uh, Sergeant McDonald and his crew, we very much welcome the opportunity to be able to come up and speak with the, with the various communities. And I can say sincerely from, uh, from the bottom of my heart that it is truly, uh, honestly, uh, an honor to be here this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. It is um, part of the Muslim community's initiative and job to be um, there for those, those in our community that have thoughts that are not conducive to what Islam actually teaches. Um, I think that's what we learned. And um, part of what um, uh, uh, Muhammad Heft was is part of the initiative of addressing those ideas. Um, we're going to open up the floor to question and answers. If anybody has written questions, we're going to go through those first and um, at the same time go through some live questions as well. Uh, I believe Carl is going to be one of the night, so if anybody has any live questions, we can go through that. And um, there will be papers that are being sent Follow-up question. Um, 
podcast is what is the Muslim community's role when they see or understand or feel like somebody is, you know, has really wonky ideas that can sound much like ISIS, for example. What is their role in this situation? Yeah, I, I did go back to what Brother Faisal said, and, and I agree with, is that, uh, you know, when, when people have ideas, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're criminals at that point. So what we need is trusted intermediaries. There's going to be people who in our community who are Salafis, Sufis, Dalikis, Shia, and if they're pro-ISIS, they're, they're probably people who always talk about the Quran and Hadith all the time and, and quote it out of context. So you probably need somebody who's on the same wavelength, but it's not somebody espousing the, the violent views that they are. So it's very important that you reach out to somebody in the community who has enough knowledge and, and the ability to uh, try to talk the person out of them, out of it, keep a counter narrative, and um, keep in mind that uh, probably if he's espousing his views on the internet, he's probably being monitored anyways. But uh, if, he, if he's going to do something or starts to talk the rhetoric and it gets past a certain point where everybody's imminence, by the way, is, is a matter of comfort. Um, you can't really uh, put a judgment on a feeling. When somebody really comes across and you're really worried, then it, it's hard to blame you if you, if you involve. But I think the first step is the community leader and let them who maybe have more experience in this then address what level needs to be taken. But definitely a counter narrative. And you can reach out to me. I'm in Toronto. I came here uh, on my own accord. I don't need gas money or a hotel. I came here because it's the right thing to do. So, I mean, you can always call me. Um, I usually pick up the phone. I try not to pick up the phone after midnight, but you know, you're welcome to call me because uh, I can bring somebody out. They might think I'm an agent, but I can maybe network with somebody who they don't think is an agent, And uh, but I know that they're the right people for them. We'll make sure to get your number out there. Anybody else for a question? I just want to comment on the title. I think the title should be changed to Violent Radicalization and its Impact on Muslims and Christians because I think it has a more of an impact on Christians than it does on Muslims. I think Muslims are more, what I, from what I see and read, they're more used to the violence. Christians aren't as much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Faisal to uh, comment on that if that's okay. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, that's kind of a generalization to, 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 to say that. If you look at statistics from the FBI, the number of terrorist incidents carried out by Muslims, this is FBI, is very minimal. The most number of terrorist acts were actually committed by white supremacists and by Christians. Not, not my figures. No, I mean so, worldwide. Worldwide, if you take it you know, there used to be a time when people just say, Buddhists never committed terrorist acts. You just have to look at Burma now, and Sri Lanka, where they're actually killing Muslims. Okay? So, you, there's bad people in every religion, every ideology, there are people who espouse violence. But what happens is, because of the work of Islamophobes, the acts of a few Muslims get projected and multiplied. So if you actually look at the faith, that's why I put up these in the readings, and I, I'm, I can email you these. These are not done by Muslims, these are academic researchers, and I can link you to the FBI, the Southern Law Poverty Center of the United States actually documents this and says that most terrorism is not committed by Muslims. Right, so to blame it, even globally, yes, because Muslims are in hot spots, they're in the middle of this. So of course they're gonna be statistically more at this time. But every group, and in fact, Tarek Fatah tweeted, because I, I saw a tweet, he, he, I think the, uh, he sent a message basically saying, so and so, this, this, uh, this many number of people were killed. Do you think they were Zoroastrians? Because he couldn't use Buddhists anymore. So he's trying to find a group, and I'm sure if you look at history, Zoroastrians at one time committed acts too. Perhaps it was the PKK. Exactly. So, 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 you know, just so that you understand the context, you have to understand the context and you have to see how these statistics can be manipulated and misused, you know, that's how I would answer. And I also see that with the internet now, where I'm much more aware of all the problems in the total world, and that's why probably the Muslims come to the forefront. 
The other thing I want to mention is... Thank you. We'll, we'll just be moving on to the next question. Yeah, I just want to ask, when you, read the, when you read the original Quran, it is written in Arabic, is that correct? Yes. And then also, when you're reading it, are you advised how to interpret it? I'm just going to move on to the um, to one of the other questions that anybody else might have. You are more than welcome to talk to Robert or Faisal or Doug after the event. Doug, you read the Quran. I, I, I will just add this. Any religious text you read, I remember I was on Michael Korn one time, and the discussion was about how the Quran is so violent. So I had passages from the Bible where there were passages that were so violent I read the passage and I said, when you read passages like this, I can understand why people are afraid of Muslims. Then we went to commercial break. We came back and we went, yeah, the Quran has those verses. I said, but that's not from the Quran, that's from the Bible. So if you look at any religious text, you'll find these things, but they're context specific. And yes, Muslims are told to read, there's a context behind it. Yeah. Yes, when Muslims were being attacked, you have the right to defend yourself. The mainstream Muslims will all tell you, Jihad means self-defense. And actually they'll tell you there's a hadith of the Prophet which is widely accepted that the greater jihad is a jihad in nafs. It's actually internal struggles. The lesser jihad is you know, fighting. But again, most scholars interpret it as in, in self-defense. There are, at times, people who said this is aggressive. It's no different from George Bush. George Bush said that in self-defense, we could do a preemptive strike. That's interpreting American law, American executive decision. So George Bush interpreted American law to say self-defense means we could attack. Similarly, there's Muslims who misinterpret the verse and say self-defense means we should kill these kuffar. First of all, who's a kuffar? It's a long discussion, but what I want to put context is every religious text has these things that can be misconstrued and misinterpreted. But the iman is, controls how you interpret the text. Thank you. Correct? Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Thanks. Uh, my question is, what message are we sending, and I don't mean we as in we here, but I guess the society in general, when <clears throat> there seems to be a big concern about Canadian youth uh, you know, going over and fighting, say in Syria or other places, and obviously this is a concern that, that they want to leave Canada and participate in this, but then just the other day you had news that you have these Canadian soldiers who returned from Afghanistan who are now saying, you know, they have this burning desire in their body to go and fight and they're going to go to Syria or to Turkey to fight. And this is presented as like an honorable thing to do that these soldiers who are young, you know, in many cases young guys are going to fight for what's right and for freedom. Whereas when it comes to other youth who are, you know, give the same justification for going to fight, it's, it's presented as a danger to the national interest. So I think Maybe if, if you could comment on this, this, why there's this double standard, right? Why is it when these young guys who come back from Afghanistan now say they want to go back and fight beside irregular forces, it's considered legitimate or okay and reasonable, but then when, when other young people do it, in particular youth who may be Muslim, it's presented as, as a threat to national security. Yes, uh, again, uh, a very good, uh, very good question. And, uh, I guess, firstly, I would uh, point out that, yes, we were aware uh, of, um, certainly personally aware of the article uh, that you were mentioning and the, and the situation. And uh, I, I'm very confident that uh, certainly the, uh, the RCMP nor the uh, Government of Canada condones uh, uh, this activity. And I would go a step further and say that while they may not have, if these individuals are doing this, they may not have uh, crossed the criminal threshold and that they uh, are not going to participate in an activity with a known terrorist entity, uh, that in itself is not entirely clear either. So um, the position is simply the, uh, certainly the RCMP nor the government can that condones that activity and in fact, um, you know, we would very much uh, dissuade uh, former military vets from taking that position. If you don't mind, I just want to add one point. One thing that I mentioned to the people, uh, because this is a big concern about this going overseas and fighting, 
As I suggested to the government that they make it illegal for joining any foreign wars across the board. And one of the problems is, is some people with dual citizenships are going back over and getting military training, joining, for example, when Hamas is considered a terrorist organization. The IDF, who are present here in Canada, are going back to fight. I think if you just make it across the board that unless it's sanctioned by the government as being a war that our military is involved in, I think nobody uh, with dual citizenship or as a Canadian should involve themselves in, in any war overseas. And that, I think, across the board would be the fairest way. Thank you. Um, so we have one of the written questions here for Facebook 15. It says, how do you see the role of Canadian media on radicalization? Are they playing a positive or a negative role? Or are they just biased? Well, I think there's some, most media, I think, are neutral, they're objective purveyors of views. There are elements of the media, uh, you know, that are, uh, that have an agenda, or certain people in the media have certain agenda, and they exploit that. So does that contribute to radicalization? I think it does to a level, because there's the siege mentality, some young people have the siege mentality, where they feel that Muslims are under attack overseas, we have all these policies that are enacted, anti-terror policies, uh, anti-terror laws, etc. And then we have the media, some elements of the media are also promoting this and perpetuating these negative understandings of Islam. But I think giving too much credence to that is falling into the conspiracy idea. Okay? That everybody's up to get us. Everything has to do with, uh, with non-Muslims. And I think Muslims need to take responsibility. I remember there was an issue where many years ago, some people in the school, principals were accused of pedophilia, of child abuse. And I remember going to court and hearing these people accept that they did certain things. And the charges were dropped later for, because of technical reasons, but these people had committed these things, but for technical reasons they were dropped. And then when I went to the community, the community was saying, well, it's all a, usually a Jewish conspiracy. So what, did, what does a Jewish conspiracy have to do with this? Right? So, I think we need to take responsibility that, yes, there are Muslims who are doing certain things. People are in denial if they think that ISIS is not recruiting them. People are in denial if they think they're not, there are people not being radicalized and going violent. Right? Yes, could ISIS have formed out of action the United States did? Just like Al-Qaeda, you know, Bin Laden was initially funded, but yes, those, that's a different discussion. But to say that people are not going and joining these things, to say that the media is making this up, that's completely, it's, it's, it's not legitimate. So we have to be critical of ourselves, but also critical of the media. Yes, there is some Islamophobia, but most of the media, even for this event, all the coverage we've gotten, all the interest we've gotten has been very positive. They want to, you know, they want to report it objectively. Now people can misconstrue and misapply, and you know, that we don't have any control over that. Brother Hatch, this is, um, you mentioned a pen from one of the questions that you could come out and say that you don't like George Bush, and no one would bug you about it. When we see Canada heading to a clamp down on the criticism of Israel, aren't, aren't your words over an oversimplification of the problem? Okay, the, the so, part about Israel? Um, so, uh, Canada recently has come down and saying anybody who says anything uh, bad against Israel, um, there's, uh, they're considered anti-Semitic or the likes thereof, um, and so this has been criticized in in the political sphere. So saying that we don't like George Bush is okay, but in Canada now there's more of a clamp down on what we say in terms of other political issues. So is it your are your sentiments an oversimplification of the problem here in Canada? That's why they only give me 15 minutes. <laughs> can't solve all the problems. But one thing I will say is that's why, as a community, we have to engage. Some of these groups have uh, huge funding, huge lobbies that lobby these governments and, and have a great influence over what they believe. And one thing I found within our community is we're still wondering whether or not it's halal to vote. I mean, if you look at voting, whether it's the lesser of two evils or the greater of two goods, the fact is we want to bring somebody in power who's the best for all of society. And sometimes the people who get into power with 30, 35, 40% vote aren't necessarily representing the vast majority of us. But in order to take that back, I think you have to decide which party you think is the best, 
try to bring them in power and try to put them towards a more balanced foreign policy. I was invited today from the Ontario Police Academy. I spent almost an hour and a half with, uh, you know, the people who are doing what INSEP's doing. And I was invited by Dr. Abby, who's a Jew. Um, that was all right. But there's a difference between Judaism and Zionism. There's a difference between what goes on in Israel. Maybe there are very good Israelis. The Likud party, I would attribute them. I don't see them any different than Hamas. But the fact of the matter is, we should be critical, but at the same time, come with solutions, because there are people that don't believe Jews have the right to exist, period. And we can't condone their, their sentiments, because there are brothers and sisters in humanity, regardless of what religion they are. So you have to be fair. You can't just make it a Jewish conspiracy, or it's all the Zionists, the Illuminati, the Freemason, blah, blah, blah. What are you doing yourself for your neighbor? What are you doing yourself for your community? Not what's going on in, in wars that we can't control. We can control how I win his heart, and your heart, and your heart. That's all we can control, because we have them within our world. I would just add that one of the, thing, one of the signs of a mature community is you can be self-critical. Okay? What, and so I'm, what I'm saying is, is maybe controversial to some people, but I always get invited to debates, and sometimes the issue comes up, you know, I remember one time being invited to, to criticize Israel and you know because a, a United Nations group composed of Saudi Arabia and Iran had declared Israel a human rights violator. So you wonder what I would say about it. Well first of all my criticism would be I would be more critical of Saudi Arabia okay and Iran at the time over Israel because I've been to Saudi Arabia the way they treat Muslims okay at least you could say the Jewish state if it's mistreating Muslims, okay? You know, I can, I'm not going to accept it or tolerate it, but I can understand it. But what is our excuse when in most so-called Muslim countries, Muslims are treated worse? And we always have a tendency, the only thing we can always agree on, unfortunately, this is something we need to overcome, is Israel is the root of the problem, or the West is the root of the problem. If something happens in Pakistan, when Muslims are killing each other because of their different you know, perspective, the theological differences, it's because India is doing it. Really? Come on, man. Wake up. We need to be self-critical, that we need to be fair and balanced. Islam, my understanding of Islam is very fair and balanced. Right? It's to be just, whether it's in your favor or against you. So be critical of what Muslims are doing. I would rather any day live in many of these Western countries and be arrested in a Western country before in any so-called Islamic country, right? And I'm sure each one of you will say that, right? So I think we need to be careful when we're always blaming. Yes, I'm very critical of our foreign policy. I'm very critical of our domestic anti-terror policies, etc. But we got to be fair and balanced. Right? People who run and think they're going to run and establish an Islamic state, good luck to you. Right? Let me see how much free expression you're going to have on Facebook. I remember posting something on Facebook saying, ISIS is a misinterpretation of Islam, and people came to me and said, what are you talking about? They're establishing it, uh, the caliphate, and this is going to be a great Islamic state, and blah, blah, blah. So I said to the person, I said, go there, and let's see you have your freedom of expression there, and then come back and tell me about it. Right? So we need to be critical. And we, need to, we have to be confident that we can criticize ourselves. But that doesn't mean I'm blaming Muslims for everything. No, there are many things, and you can look me up, I've written a lot of stuff criticizing American foreign policy, Canadian foreign policy, domestic policies, but you've got to be fair and balanced. Why are you preaching nonviolence to one of the most marginalized groups in North America? Is it approach um, is it is it is it approaching the consequence instead? Wouldn't it be much more beneficial to preach nonviolence to the troops, to the lawmakers, and to the law and law enforcement who kill more people from fringe terrorist groups? How can you deny that this is not inherent in the system within our imperialist and colonialist apparatus? <laughs> It's 
Well, thank you. I I read. Um, don't know where to begin to answer that question. Uh, other than to say, um, we reach out to. I, I say it. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but we reach out to all communities. And when I say all communities, I sincerely mean all communities. And uh, um, you know that could be. Jewish communities, Muslim communities, the various Muslim communities that are out there, it could be First Nations communities, you name it. And uh, I guess really, um, why would we not preach nonviolence? And uh, I guess really, uh, the comment I think was, that was uh, made there in terms of, what was it, about the actions that, that the state or the police take? Uh, you know, law enforcement, unfortunately, uh, you know, law enforcement is obliged to take, uh, you know, drastic actions at time, but again, they always have to be commensurate with the, with the rule of law. And uh, I, I can say that certainly having been a uh, police officer for 37 years now, um, I think I can speak very safely on behalf of all my colleagues that nobody takes this matter very lightly. And uh, our purpose here is for peace. And we are called peace officers, not police officers. Before the courts were called peace officers. And uh, uh, we very strongly adhere uh, to that matter and to the rule of law. So I hope I have helped address some of the points. I think that it's very obvious that it has to be a multi-pronged approach. I think, you know, Islam was revealed over 23 years. I think we can all agree, you know, that if, if we don't like something, we have to be the change we want to see. And I think it was a quote by Gandhi. Gandhi. Um, come on, I mean, there's a lot of warmongering, we understand that. But how do these people come to their conclusion? Who are the people putting them in the power? And what are their ideas? What are their interests? If you want to change something, we have to get involved. We can't be armchair quarterbacks and saying that this is all the problem. What do you have to as a solution? I'm one person of six billion people. I can only make the difference I can make. But do I believe America warmongers? Ken Kissinger said, they, you know, they have interests. They don't have friends. They go around the world. They take over places. You know, many people know or call them imperialists. I go on my Facebook, I'm much more open. But I don't think that's a solution because people might then think that I'm, I'm holding all Americans account. Ferguson, look what happened in Ferguson. Many African Americans would say that they have a lot of problems at home. But what is their solution? Winning one heart at a time. I don't have all the answers to stop the war machine, the profit machine. I know that if I change his ideas about me, I've done something. And then maybe his voice can be my Abu Talib amongst the people in Ottawa and like them coming today, a few hours before, maybe under pressure not to come, they were able to say, wait a minute, we know what we're doing. We've seen the results. Please don't make this a political issue. And that's because of hard work. But that's only one issue. All these issues are going to take a lot more than this uh, two-hour gathering. And none of us are going to have all the solutions immediately. But get involved. Hold the door open for a girl. Try to be polite. Win everybody's heart, but win it with kindness and mercy so they can see our actions, not our complaints. Since Gandhi was quoted, since Gandhi was quoted, I'll quote again. Um, you know, um, get the quote now. <laughs> uh, two wrongs don't make a right. Okay. Yes, there's war mongering. Yes, the United States, even Canada, is complicit in some of these acts with, you know, which is violent. But here's how, how I look at it. Because I'm very critical of what's happening in the, in the Muslim world, which the West has played a role, colonized, but also Muslims have played a role. Right? But how does that justify an individual being a vigilante and committing a crime? It's a crime in Canada to do this. When you came to Canada, or you're a citizen of Canada, you've entered into a treaty with Canada. I look at it from an Islamic law perspective. 
And Ibn al-Karim al jawziya said, when you sign a contract or a treaty, that becomes your sharia. So even if it contradicts some elements of sharia according to Ibn al-Karim al jawziya that's why the Prophet, when he entered the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when he got attacked, and Muslims were running away from uh, you know, Makkah to join him, and he sent them back, and the companion well, he's Muslim. So well, we signed a treaty. So when you come to Canada and you become a Canadian citizen or a resident, you've entered into a treaty with Canada. Now when you go and, and go against the criminal law, you're violating Islamic law. That's my understanding of Islamic law. So these people going and fighting, if they don't like the law, they can change it. It's a democracy. You can get people to change the law. Some people have done that. They said you can go, you know, fight for the IDF. Right? You want to go and make law, you have the right to do that. But don't say you accept the law and you're a citizen of this country and enter into this treaty and then backstab. Because every interpretation of Islamic law that you can't violate a treaty. Then you want, some of them are doing this. They're giving up their citizenship so they're going. Well, then when they come back, they're going to get arrested, right? Because they've broken the law. So I don't see it that people taking violence into their own hands. I mean, well, because they're doing this, because they're killing us, we're going to do the same thing. So that's the way I look at it, because I was very, I'm very critical of American foreign policy, but I'm, never, I'm not going to go and do this. And I have to justify it myself using Islamic principles. And that's how I do it, and that's how I would tell people, how can you do this? Because you're, you're being a traitor. You're violating not only the law, but Islamic law. to um, Faisal Kuti and Superintendent Doug. Uh, the question states, uh, considering the profile of a violent radical is someone isolated and alienated from the Muslim and broader community, is there a strong incentive for monitor monitoring mosques and other organizations? Yes, again, uh, uh, certainly a, a legitimate question, and I can uh, say quite um, quickly, uh, I did refer to it earlier, that uh, we don't purport to be the uh, uh, police of theology. So uh, we have the freedom of expression, freedom of religious affiliation in this country. Uh, we certainly uh, do not, do not uh, target uh, religious institutions. My criticism of that would only be that uh, CSIS does have a practice of not necessarily, I think, targeting uh, religious uh, groups as a, a direct practice. I don't think it's a policy. Uh, I don't think it's a written policy. But I guess there's something that happens that people end up being uh, profiled. And this is problematic because we've seen people who, you know, have been approached by uh, CSIS agents saying, so you're, you're attending this mosque, can you tell us about you know, what happens there, can you tell these kind of things. Okay. So for me, that's a little problematic because uh, you know, I represent, represent a lot of different mosques, and the mosques would come to us and say, well, you know, someone just said that CSIS is talking to them, and now they're afraid to come to the mosque, right? Uh, they're afraid to donate to the mosque. What's the issue? And we've actually arranged meetings between uh, mosque boards with CSIS. To say, like, what do you have? What, what, what's your issue? Instead of uh, approaching people as they leave the mosque, uh, you know, because this creates fear. And you already have a siege mentality, and then, of course, the next thing you know, people call on the phone and say, you know what, don't go to that mosque because you know what? And I'm not exaggerating this because we have actually set up meetings between, uh, you know, various mosque boards and CSIS. Now, CSIS has tried to rectify this as to change this, but we as Canadian citizens have to hold them accountable and say, look, and I'll give you one story where CSIS was reported. Uh, CSIS was quoted in the Toronto Star that they were recruiting people from the community. And CSIS put out a statement saying, we don't do that. Next day, I get a call from someone who was actually approached by CSIS and basically said, you don't need to become an agent for us because we want to get information from you about this particular mosque. And he was given a number to call. So I said, come to my office. Let's call from my office. And we called the agent. And basically he was trying to recruit him. Which is a little, you know, for me, I know they have to do their job. They have to do get intelligence gathering. 
And this individual, the, the funny part was, he was a board member of the Canadian Muslim Civil Liberties Association. We've been criticizing and condemning this. So what kind of intelligence do you have? You're actually recruiting somebody who actually complained to the media that you're doing this. Right? So that's not very intelligent. And I, we actually brought it to their attention. So this is pathetic. You, you told the Toronto Star that you don't do this. And then you're trying to recruit somebody from the uh, Canadian Muslim Civil Liberties Association. Right? So, I don't know how much it, you know, I, I, it happens these days, but we recently requested, have requested meetings with them to say, look, you report somebody who's actively working with this mosque. And part of the reason I think is, there's a, you know, CSIS is not a law enforcement agency. Okay? There's different constraints, different laws that apply to them. And you don't have a duty to speak to them. You don't have a right, you, you, know, you, you don't have to speak to them constitutionally, so I don't want to talk to you. If you're, especially if you're a Canadian citizen, you can get away with it. If you're not a citizen, if you're a you know, permanent resident or a refugee, then they might, you know, the fear is, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. So you end up meeting with them. Okay? But mostly Canadian citizens, they don't. But it creates this, 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 this fear. And I think we need to come up with a better strategy. We need to figure out a way to avoid this kind of siege mentality where people are, you know, uh, are afraid of this. Because we want to be on the same team, right? Because we're interested in the same thing. And I think, uh, you know, at some level, CSIS needs to engage with the community with this kind of work. I mean, it's not the responsibility of the RCMP here, but CSIS, part of the problem is there's a lot of money that's been sunk into CSIS. And so there's lots of agents out there, right? And they have to do work. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessary. It is necessary. We as a, as a society also think it's really necessary to have so many agents running around, right, trying to interview people. And sometimes you can tell pretty quickly that these people are not really, you know, you're wasting your time on these people, wasting tax money on these people. So I, I think there's a need, but maybe part of the solution is they have to really, uh, more Muslims have to be involved. More Muslims, not just by name, but Muslims are really involved in the community to work with CSIS. So we can help identify look, when you're really wasting your time and you can really explore further. I mean, that's a much longer answer, I'm sorry about that. Hmm. I think this would be a good question for um, Superintendent Dekvats, just because uh, you'd be able to probably address the issue. If people want to join ISIS, why not just say goodbye and good riddance? Why arrest and force people who don't want to be here to stay here? Yeah, well, again, a <clears throat> very good question, and uh, I mean, it is a concern of uh, young people going uh, over to fight for the cause for ISIS. So, what, what, what can we do? What do we do? Uh, well, if uh, if we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they uh, they are in fact going to do that, we can arrest them, uh, arrest these people under the provisions of Section 83 of the Criminal Code, the anti-terrorism legislation. Uh, if it doesn't quite meet the threshold, there are other uh, avenues that have uh, we've seen recently taken by uh, other federal agencies, for example, CBSA or Passport. Uh, people can have their passports revoked, uh, so then uh, they, they can't uh, travel abroad. Now, uh, I don't guess, as I would imagine, it's not lost to anybody here that uh, recently we, we had the gas plant attack overseas where a number of innocent people were murdered and uh, two of the perpetrators were two young men who came from the London, Ontario area. So uh, I would suggest that we, we, we do have an obligation to, to prevent people from, from traveling so that they cannot commit these acts. Uh, I guess then by extension the question would be so they don't travel so they stay here so how is it going to manifest itself here in Canada? Well, again, uh, it puts a considerable onus on, on law enforcement. However, uh, if the if we can prove again beyond a reasonable doubt that they are in, insistent on committing a violent act, we can take the appropriate action. Uh, it is, I mean, it is, it does require resources to do this. Uh, but again, I believe as a as a country, uh, and certainly from, the, from a law enforcement perspective, we have an obligation to protect uh, innocent people, and that would be the position on that. We 
have one final written question, and then we're going to do one, um, or hopefully we have one final written question. I'm not sure. Okay, three more. Um, so I'll move on. Uh, this is to uh, Faisal Kupti. It says, you mentioned that Gandhi, Mandela, and Martin Luther King were radicals. What I want to ask is, who did these young, pe who did these people radicalize against, and what caused this radicalization? Um, what I want to ask is, who did these people radicalize against? I guess who were they um, fighting? Who, what cause they were fighting for? And what caused this radicalization? So why did they do what they did? Well, you know, Gandhi was against a British occupation. Uh, Mandela was against a uh, apartheid regime in South Africa. And Martin Luther King against all the civil rights issues that were taking place in, <coughs> in the United States. So, you know, it's a good, they had grievances, but they didn't necessarily take it to, uh, to violence. I mean, Mandela at one time, as part of the ANC, was considered a terrorist, right? Because, you know, the state, like he had gone against state law, which had defined him as this. So that goes to the expression, uh, the expression, you know, that one man's terrorist, another man's freedom fighter. So I like to use, I like to convey this more as a criminal issue. Because when you get into to use of the word, and that's a whole separate topic to discuss, it becomes politicized. And that's what's happening now, even in Canada, unfortunately. The critique of the laws I would have is, for instance, you know, certain charities have been branded as terrorists. Why? Because at this time they're not agreeable to Canadian foreign policy, right? Remember the Mujahideen? They were what? They were the Mujahideen and the Americans and the Western version, and we were urged to go and fight in those days because they were fighting the Russians. But the moment they shifted, they became terrorists, right? So uh, that's the policy, and that's what that's what I have an issue with. Uh, but treating it as a criminal issue, which is what it is when people, when Canadian citizens, Canadian residents go against our laws and commit crimes, whether it's going overseas to join these causes that we've said is you know, illegal, uh, that I don't have a problem with and that's how we need to frame it. This is really an issue of crime prevention for a Muslim community in our community and that's how I would like to look at it. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question. Um, so my question needs a little bit of context. So and it's directed towards uh, Faisal Kuti. I'll try to keep it brief because I know that we're running short on time. But uh, uh, there was a the debate in the Oxford Union uh, Oxford Union debate, and uh, the Mahdi Hassan had mentioned that there was a uh, poll that was taken, it was the largest poll regarding Muslims and violence. And in the 90th percentile, Muslims were against violence, but it was somewhere between five and six percent of Muslims who were for violence, but when asked why they cited political reasons, not uh, uh, religious ones. Uh, and so it's important to note that uh, actually in the year 2014, this is the 100th year anniversary for uh, you know, the fall of the Ottoman Empire where Muslim and Arab countries became you know, imperialized or the subject of imperialization and uh, colonialization as well. Uh, to add sex people agreement, everything that happened has continued to happen up into uh, up until today. And so our countries have been subject to violence uh, at the hands of Western imperialist countries. Uh, that being said, it's really easy to understand that these groups that like ISIS aren't, don't exist in a vacuum. So they are, uh, they I guess have materialized as a reaction to the uh, Western foreign policies that have been developed here in the West. So. My question is, uh, you had a diagram that was, uh, you know, with the four categories as to what would lead somebody to violent extremism, and you said that it wasn't to scale. Uh, I believe that a large part, or actually the main reason why people would uh, turn to violent extremism, or sorry, violent radicalism, is because uh, of their grievances. Because many of the reasons, and like I said, with the previous uh, statements and evidences that were uh, posted by Matthew Hassan, yeah, uh, is that, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yes, sorry, so the, the grievances main, are the main thing and the main uh, reason why people go over to violent radicalism and not the other three categories. The other three categories are, of course, supplementary, but uh, would you agree that grievances are the main reason for violent radicalism? Anybody who resources this has grievances. 
And this is you know, what Gallup, Gallup did a poll, it was the largest poll ever done of the Muslim world. It was the largest poll ever done for anybody. And it was done in the Muslim world, and they found, he said, 93% were against this. Uh, small percent, five or six or seven percent, were uh, said that this was justified in the use of politics. And it was contrasted with studies of Americans and Westerners were more said in order to, to use violence was justified. So to put that into perspective, and in fact, immediately right after 9-11, if you saw the reaction in the streets of New York, many people were asked, what should we do? He said, just bomb all those Afghans, to kill all of them, right? It's a visceral reaction because that's what happened when you've seen your people, your loved one killed. So I perfectly understand what's happening over there. But it's all messed up. But how does a Canadian citizen who's living in peace, who has no restrictions on his religious practice, who actually enjoys more religious freedom here than in any so-called Muslim world, who can have differences here, how does that justify this person going over there and committing a crime? That's the point we're discussing here. I totally agree with you. There's all kinds of legitimate agreements, and I actually agree for them too. But how is how me taking up arms and going over there and joining this thing, which has neither head nor tail, right? How does that solve? That's, that's the issue we were talking about. And we're talking about 130 Canadians have gone, which now impacts the rest of us Muslims as well. Because unfortunately, in a democracy, this is unfortunate because the mob can also set in. What I'm afraid is because these 130 individuals who do this, the government is going to clamp down. Okay? Because the law enforcement, they don't make up the laws. They don't make up the laws. They apply the laws who legislatures enact. So the mob can say these Muslims should all be locked up because of these 130 crazy people. So if we're not seen to be in the forefront objecting to this, opposing to this, and being the ones identifying these people, we, we will not have support to, to, to use the democratic process to change these laws. Because I was at a conference in Valparaiso University where two of the lawyers for um, Guantanamo detained were there. We talked about the same thing, motivation. But the Treasury Department lawyer was there. And the way he was talking, the two defense lawyers said, I think the time is going to come when you know, we're just going to put all Muslims in, a, in, a, in internment camps. And they weren't joking. They were serious. And the Treasury Department guy, he didn't really object to it. So I said, just give me notice, I'll run back to Canada. But I'm sure Canada's going to do the same thing if the United States does that. Right? So it's a legitimate fear because it's happened in the past. Other communities have gone through this. So we have to do our part, which is help work with the system. But that doesn't mean we say these legit these groups are not there. They're totally legitimate. Right? And that's my point is I don't want to focus on de radicalizing, changing, de brainwashing them, because that means you don't have any legitimate. I don't want people to brainwash me that Muslim world is being oppressed and persecuted. I can't brainwash that out of you because I know. But that doesn't mean that I can now pick up arms here as a Canadian citizen and go and join a, a terrorist entity, which Canada is defined as a terrorist entity. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, yes, right there. Uh, it's a, kind of a comment, commenting more than anything else. We hear a lot about um, those crazies and the um, kind of depicting people uh, becoming involved as crazies and so on. And I have a couple of reactions that that tweaks in me. One is that uh, it's another stereotyping of people with Ill mental illnesses and that the vast majority of people with mental illnesses do not Create, are, are not very are not violent and do not create violent acts and then also that it doesn't doesn't have us deal with the vulnerabilities of the adolescent brain for example that makes one more vulnerable to certain things and that would be up until the age about 25 it also doesn't deal with the vulnerabilities of those who uh, experience isms and discrimination or to to large degrees and how that negatively impacts our mental illness, our mental health. And so there are certain things that uh, negatively impact all of our mental health from, uh, from experiences and so on and these things. And so kind of depicting it as in uh, crazies, uh, for me, 
It makes it almost like a different kind of human uh, and a less than human. And so if we can sort of maintain the way in which these things impact, and uh, not just impact, but involve all of us, and that then, you know, I think that would go ways. I just want to say that I've used that term. I've used that term. What I meant is not, not not to do with any mental illness issue. My reference of that term, uh, because th there's some people who go to this because of mental illness, but there's some people who go to this. They don't have to be perfectly sane. What I was referring to as crazy is somebody who can actually behead another human being. I don't think they're human. If they have mental issues, that's that's different. Okay, that's. That I can, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, justify it really, but I can understand what you're saying from a clinical perspective. But I'm talking about a perfectly sane individual who thinks his God tells him to behead someone. Okay, that to me is crazy. That's from my, uh, you know, I, I can easily defend that position, and, and I will say that's crazy. That's, that's what I mean by. That. Um, any more oral questions? Uh, right there. One second. Not meaning to put you on the spot, but you've been on these spots several times this evening, so I may as well ask my question. For each of you, what do you see happening in the next five years? And the reason why I ask the question is because when we're dealing with the Muslim communities, both at home and overseas, we're dealing with a very young population. Um, we're dealing with populations where the median age can be somewhere between 15 and 25. And this is an age where young people are very idealistic and they will willingly sacrifice themselves for a great cause I sense that there's a great deal of revolutionary romanticism that's alive in the world when one reads about girls uh, going to uh, Syria from London or from Vienna. Um, one understands the impulses that are driving them, is the desire to see a better world, a world where there will be more justice and equity for all. And this poses each of you before certain uh, difficulties in terms of uh, planning for the next five years or anticipating what kind of problems you'll have to confront uh, with the next five years. What do you see happening in the next five years? I would ask you the next ten years, but five years already is stretching it. Well, I'll, I'll commence uh, to answer the uh, questions really from, from uh, my perspective is that uh, Every point you've raised is, is quite legitimate, and uh, certainly we see quite a, uh, a range of age, as you said correctly, from 15 to 30, 35, and, and beyond. Uh, what do I see in terms of five years? Well, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we hold forums such as this, and why we, it's so important to uh, get involved in very positive interaction and dialogue with the communities, particularly the youth. And uh, my, my, my true sense is that the solution lies there with our interaction with, with youth so that they can develop a very sound understanding of the geopolitical things that are happening and you're quite right, I mean, adolescents are adolescents, and I'm sure that there are, uh, I'll call them children that are, that are abroad, that are there because of the bravado that is associated with it, and, uh, and I can say I know that uh, there are likely some that have returned, were lucky enough to be able to come back because they, it wasn't quite what they signed up for, it wasn't as they had, had imagined, and I guess the, by extension, the, the, the the converse of that is that there are others that return and are more committed than when they left. And that is really what poses a threat to, to Canada. And that is, a, that is the point that we are very concerned about as, a, uh, as the RCMP. Where is going in five years? Uh, I, I really don't have the answer to that. Uh, clearly, uh, Canada and its foreign policy is not for me to comment on, 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 on Canada's foreign policy. 
Um, but I'm, you know, we are involved in the conflict uh, abroad with with the with our allies, and uh, no doubt there are pressures that come with that. How long this will be problematic? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. All I would say is that in terms of the of a solution, from my perspective at least, and, uh, and from the RCMPs, is to present the piece on as clearly as working with the youth. I think that. Therein lies the, the fundamental piece that we have to be so keen to, to engage these young people in all the communities so that they have a clear understanding, both from, a, uh, from the leaders in the community and from, uh, from the religious leaders of the various communities. So they, they do, they are able to formulate a, a, a proper uh, understanding of, the, of, their, of their religion, if it's religious, or of the geopolitical situation, if it's that. So they have that uh, that full complete understanding. It's difficult to say. I spent a lot of time overseas, um, and I think it has a lot to do with how we frame our ideas of what's going to come towards us. Because there's a lot of um, YouTube videos. There's a lot of media attention, specifically on the Muslim community. I am optimistic about one thing. I think. From what I understand, um, the Muslims uh, per capita are the highest in, in all the universities in Canada. And so I think we have a lot of young and dynamic people also countering that by integrating into society and, and offering solutions and, and, and get, getting the, air, the ears of those who are influential or have the decision-making uh, policies in government. Having said that, um, what's happening is serious. There's a lot of media attention. I think unless we're extremely patient with people and we don't stereotype the way we feel we're stereotyped, uh, I could, um, it could go either way. Um, I, I definitely, I mean, a lot of the future, but um, I think we have to be really, um, we have to be really, uh, I'm, I'm lost for words. We have to be out there. We have to be uh, aggressively trying to um, be part of society and win people's hearts over so they know that what they're seeing in the media doesn't represent us, although it should be common sense to many. It's, it's really not. People are watching 10 minutes of CNN and, and forming an opinion and actually telling me what I believe. So we have to be prepared to be patient with that and, and win them over because our actions will speak. But um, we have to be proactive. There's the word. <laughs> be proactive. That's, you know, in all areas, up through politics all the way down, and, um, and hopefully that will make a change. But be positive, because over the last 10 years, I have been Muslim now 16 years, and I'll just give you a quick little thing, is that when I first became Muslim, it was a really big deal to have a mosque. I, I took my shahada at the Awful Islamic Center in, in Mississauga. Now, we're, we're involved in building hospitals, building community centers, we're starting to see the need for social services, so we're a new developing community, but there's, I think, well over 100 mosques in Toronto. And that's a testament to us as, as growing. I think the people, the uncles from the 70s, they didn't have anything. So I think in terms of the, the, uh, the dynamics of our community, it's headed in the right direction, but we have to not buy into the propaganda because I don't believe most Canadians are buying into the propaganda. I think sometimes we preempt them with our stereotypical feeling of what we think they believe as thought police. And we, we sometimes lose some really good people, which uh, I think Canada is comprised of. I've been asked to skip this question. This is not an interest in I'll skip it. Thank you. Um, but I will start off with you on the next question that we want to conclude with, um, just because we're running out of time. And just to note, we are going to pray um, the Isha prayer for anybody who would like to pray in congregation in the back after the event. So. Um, Stay tuned for that. Uh, so the question for all the three of you is, um, what do you think about Bill C-44 when it, um, and it's uh, the new uh, powers that the CSIS has been given um, in terms of anti-terrorism surveillance? I think <laughs> I'm a critic of any kind of tightening of the laws as a lawyer. <laughs> Obviously, 
Uh, what I see, and I'll talk more generally, not just about this, immediately after the Ottawa attack, uh, we saw the government introduce new legislation. They had already the way to go, and they were just waiting for the right moment or something. And then they came out with this. Now, some of this is problem, a lot of this is problematic, and there's more in the pipeline. And what I, what I fear is unintended consequences. What do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. So I remember actually sitting with the Justice Minister at the time, I forget her name now, Alberta, she's from Alberta. She's a law professor now, I forget her name now. So I remember sitting at a, at a gathering with her and um, they, had tightened, they had tightened laws about contributing to charities. And you know, Muslims have an obligation to contribute two and a half percent of your earnings or your wealth, you know, to, to, to charitable causes. And by them tightening and targeting uh, a number of charities for really political reasons, because they were funding certain causes that were now defined as terrorists for political reasons, it's very easy to define something as terrorist. By doing that, what they didn't realize is they created a bigger problem. Right? Why? Why do I say that? Because a time came when I, you know, there are individuals in the community who give 50,000, 100,000 in zakat. And they have to give it because you're taught that if you don't give this, your money's not pure for yourself. They have to have an out outlet. So when they target these registered charities, and they've done this a number of times now, especially the Harper government, when people do, they don't want to give to registered charities. So what do they do? They have to get rid of this money. And I told the adjustment, you're creating a bigger problem because you know what's going to happen? They won't give to these registered charities which you can track and police and you know see where it goes. They're gonna deal in cash. And they're gonna give it to people who say, I'll get it to the cause. So it's a these are all unintended consequences. So imagine somebody giving hundred thousand dollars cash. The World Trade Center mommy they say was done with what, fifty thousand or something? Right? So imagine, so they're trying to solve the same thing with these no fly lists, the example I gave you. Really they say a real terrorist is not on the list. Why? because he didn't get tipped off. So who's on this list? Right? So there's lots of different laws that they enact knee-jerk reaction. And what does it do? It contributes to radicalization because people see this. This is targeting Muslims. Why all of a sudden even the Harper, Harper government right now is conducting audits of not just Muslim charities, but any charities that are criticizing the, the, and actually trying to start an article saying all of the charities that were not critical of his policy, they're not being audited. And that's dangerous because Revenue Canada was supposed to be an independent arm, you know, you know, independent organization, not to be dictated politically. So this government, you know, the consequences of the actions of this government is going to create a lot of people, radicalize a lot of people, unfortunately. Because it's very hard, difficult for people like myself to defend when I get approached. No, they're not. They are targeted. And I say, no, they're not. It's unintended. It's not really, they're not after Muslims. They're not after Islam. It gets harder and harder with the actions that this government takes. So for me, as a lawyer, when I went to law school, if somebody told me 19, it's going to age me here, in 1993, when I was in law school, 94, when I was in law school, somebody said, you know they're going to be, uh, people are going to be issuing torture warrants? They're going to be talking about torture warrants? I'd be kind of crazy. Not in our Western democracies. All of a sudden I come out, and then guess what happens? Harvard University law professors. They will block our writing articles about, we should be issuing torture warrants, right? This is going to creep, it's going to creep into the rest of society. Just the, It starts impacting Muslims first, and a bunch of uh, former uh, Supreme Court justices speaking in Ottawa said the same thing. You know, these are going to impact the Muslim community first, and then the rest of us. And let me end this one example. How, how does it impact you? When the drones first came out in the United States, no American cared about it, because drones were being used, what, for surveillance overseas for military reconnaissance. Nobody cared. Then they said, hey, it's a great power, a tool to get militants. Ah, they were not Americans. Militants, no problem. No due process, who cares? Because they're not Americans. This devalued America in everybody's lives. Then next step was now we can even kill American citizens with drones. Well, it's just a brown Muslim guy or, or Arab Muslim guy. They didn't really care. Americans didn't care. Now they're saying and then actually police force, local police forces are using drones to do surveillance against America. Now America is like, oh, well, hang on a second. I don't want this being used. This is the creeping effect of national security legislation. And unfortunately, this government, right, and I'm probably
probably going to get a lot of it for saying this, has been increasing and tightening and introducing these legislation which is going to affect the Muslim community first and, have, and then eventually affect other Canadians, but also contributes to the radicalization process, which we're trying to fight here, right? But they need to, you know, they, they need to take cognizance of this and accept this, not belittle it, like Harper, I think, uh, belittle, well, you know, some of your policies may be radicalizing, you need to belittle it. Well, you know what, then you're gonna feel the consequences of this, because it's just normal reaction. When you suppress something, and when you target something, it's gonna explode. That's just normal. So that's how I'm gonna end, end this night, huh? Positive note. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, unfortunately, I mean, I, I guess I'm an optimist. Every problem is an opportunity. I, I don't like the way it seems like we're turning into a police state. But at the same time, um, I think it's a testament to our community that we have all this monitoring and, and you rarely find anybody up to anything. And sometimes the best they can find on us is that we made a comment about the Harper government. Um, you know, really, I hope it, it changes, but I don't think it's going to change until we bring in um, people who are more balanced and are actually following the people in academia. I find it interesting that a lot of the policies of the RCMP and, and policing agencies, the way they're following, are, are, are more like in line with what Justin Trudeau says. So it's kind of ironic on the ground, the kind of outreach they're doing and the kind of concern they have for the Muslims is more in line with somebody like him. So it's up to you if you vote for him, but hopefully whoever comes into power will will bring back a little bit of balance instead of this, um, what appears to be a, a policing state. Well, I, I'd just like to uh, firstly comment that um, you know, my fellow co-panelists, um, um, we made sure different professional uh, opinions, and uh, I guess that's to be understood. And the other thing I would, certainly from my perspective, I'm here as a member of the Royal Canadian Mount Police. Uh, my position is completely apolitical in that uh, I, I am not in a position to uh, take a position uh, that is of a political nature. So I, I think that's probably very well understood here. Uh, what I would say in terms of the legislation, and uh, I'm appreciating uh, Fazel as a, as a defense lawyer and uh, that's fine, I mean, but from a law enforcement perspective, uh, obviously uh, legislation that can be brought into place. We've already said that we believe that we have a uh, potentially, well, potentially we have a very serious threat. Uh, how do we how do we ensure the safety of Canadians? And uh, if there's legislation that is brought in uh, that has been well researched, that is balanced, that uh, allows you know. Well, certain rules of law, but what allows for transparency, um, you know, anything that makes it easier and easier, I guess, uh, well, I don't, the word easy is not correct, that allows me as a police officer to ensure the safety, uh, the greater safety of Canadians, and clearly that, that is a good thing. Um, but in terms of the politics around it, uh, I'm really not in a position to uh, comment on.